Hello everyone. So today will be the、uh, second session for lecture five A, like a part one for the inheritance lecture. So I already answer about four to five questions yesterday in the、uh, the other、uh, recording session. You can definitely go to lectures page under week number seven. You can find the recording from yesterday and also the notes. So I don't need to repeat. But definitely today, after I go over、uh, some quick announcements, some ti、uh, some tips on the work items ahead, and I'll open the floor for any question you might have today. Then we can answer them. Okay. All right. Let me、uh, just talk about some quick announcement. Okay. Your lecture week number eight has just been released on Tuesday, early Tuesday. And let me just uh just to tell you that for lecture week number eight, it builds on top uh lecture week number seven. So you really have to make sure you uh grasp the proper understanding about week number seven before you can move on to week number eight. If you haven't got a chance to ask me a question today, uh reach out to me. You know you know how to reach out to me either by email or office hour. For week number eight specifically, we talk about typecasts. It's a very、uh, interesting topic. It's also very important for you to understand. Otherwise, you wouldn't really understand inheritance、uh, properly. Especially, we talk about compilation versus something called class cast exception. So that's something you will see the complete coverage uh, in uh, in week number eight. So that's something you want to pay more attention to. Okay, and. In addition to it, also number two, it's more like a con、uh, continuing topic、uh, called the instance of operator. Right. So these are the two main、uh, outcomes you want to get、uh, for week number eight, right? Which we'll talk about next、uh, next week,、uh, Thursday. Okay. So study your lecture steadily and then put your questions either on the Google Doc or just bring them to the Q and A session、uh, to benefits. For your programming test number two,、uh, nothing else I want to say. I think uh, it's uh, starting today and also tomorrow, as usual. It's going to be a twenty-four hour submission period. So please make sure about the policies about programming requirements as, and also submission. And again, my advice would be、uh, leave about ten minutes.、Uh, set set off some alarm to really leave、uh, yourself、uh, about ten minutes to for the submission. You don't want to miss、uh, the、uh, deadline that's set by the E class. And for your lab number four. Uh, my intention is I want everybody to maybe focus more on the lecture,、uh, week number eight or week number seven. You're if you're catching up and also your programming test too. So I will release、uh, lab number four、uh, next Monday, and you you will definitely give、uh, given enough time as usual、uh, to complete the lab, so you don't have to worry. But lab number four is definitely going to be based on what you learned、uh, in week number seven and eight about the inheritance and polymorphism, dynamic binding. You will definitely get a chance to exercise in the lab. And about your marks, okay. So there are several parts. Let me mention that I already sent us an earlier announcement, uh, I、uh, earlier this week. So for your lab number zero, part one, and your lab number zero, part two, your lab number one, and also your programming test one. For these assessments, I will. I'm gonna、uh, send you a link、uh, by the end of tomorrow, Friday. As I,、uh, as I mentioned in my earlier announcement, I'm still finalizing the raw results given by the TA. So you're going to、uh, go to a site called ePost. Okay, that's where you can see all the marks、uh, for for your work、uh, in this course. And also, you're going to see、uh, you're going to、uh, have a way to actually see the feedback about like how many test cases run on your submission and how many test cases you actually、uh, fail, something like that. So you will have to use the remote lab. To actually、uh, log in, very easy. I'll give you the link. Just log into the remote lab using your EECS account, which you have been using for lab submission. And then you're going to run some certain commands, which I will include、uh, in my、uh, announcement tomorrow when I reach out to you. Okay, and、uh, you will have a chance to actually submit some requests for grading. Right, that's something I will also mention in my announcement tomorrow. Yeah, we're going to let the TA to actually handle the request properly. So we are not going to deal with them,、uh, maybe over emails or maybe、uh, over Q and A. It's not appropriate. So we'll let the TA deal with them offline. And then if there's anything、uh, that might need to be brought to my attention, the TA will speak to me. All right, that's how we're going to handle that. I'll include the instruction for you. You,、uh, you will get about ten、uh, days or so to think about if you want to submit for regrading. Right. All right, that's about this assessment here, and also for your written test number two. Okay, for your written test number two, I'll release it also tomorrow. Okay, so it's going to be released also on Friday. 
November fifth. I'll uh, maybe early tomorrow, maybe uh shortly before uh these assessments are actually released or at the same time. Yeah, I'm not sure. Okay, I'll release them soon. All right, so that's about the uh, administrative issues I want to speak about in the, uh, at first. Do you guys have any questions just related to uh, the course? Administrative issues first, and then we'll get to the technical stuff. Anyone? Feel free. You can speak up or you can put on a chat. Either way works. Okay, I'll pause for one more moment just to see if you got any questions. MD, please. Hi, um, so this is a question uh, regarding lab three. Um, uh, about how so, to uh, lab three? Uh, you know what, if that's I'm technical, have, yeah. if that's technical, yeah, maybe hold your question first and I'll just want to see if there's any administrative issues first and I'll definitely okay. get to you. Yeah, just hold on, please. Okay, okay guys, any uh, administrative issues before we move on to your fellow students' uh, technical questions? Okay, hearing none. Okay, so now uh, there's no more, uh, no further Google Doc question I can see from the Google Doc. So I presume you guys might be okay, but I can take any questions down. I think MD before you, if you don't mind, I think one of your fellow students before the recording started, they have some question about programming. Maybe I'll let them go first. Yeah, go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Uh, so I just had two questions. The first one being, for methods, right? Is it okay if we add like Java annotations, like uh, add override? Um, just okay. because it kind of makes sure it, it like forces you to properly override the method. Yeah, yeah. That, I, I see um, what you mean. Okay, so I think uh, what what you're talking about is the uh, 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 the tag at Eclipse overrides. Yes. yes. Very good. I think uh, what will apply in your upcoming programming test or your lab usually will be either the equals method or the two string method. Mm -hmm. So I would say it would be okay if you include this tag, that's not a problem. So basically, as you said, the, the tag will actually force you to actually overwrite to redeclare the method. Force uh, force you to redeclare and also redefine the method. Yeah, I'm just uh, trying to uh, address the point as well to other fellow students, redefine the methods. It would definitely be okay if you uh, include the override method. In some way, just having some extra check that's actually uh, done by Eclipse. On the other hand, it would also be okay if you choose not to include it. Okay? If you didn't include it, for example, override, that's also fine. Also fine. Because whenever you try to redeclare really the method, for example, you just say public Boolean equals, and then you take some objects, OBJ. As soon as you redeclare really the method in the proper way, uh, it will be treated as an overridden version as a method, especially when you go over uh, week number seven and week number eight for the inheritance lecture. I didn't include the override tag on the uh, on the code. It's not it's not necessary. I think the override tag is only for the Eclipse again to do some extra check for you. All right. So short response: either include it or not to include it. Both are fine. It's completely up to you. Got it. Uh, okay. Thank you. And no, secondly, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, was. I just wanted to make sure. So for all the practice tests that you give us, for some reason on E class, I see that my grade changes based off the results of this practice test. Just to make sure and to like like um, verify, these practice tests, these examples tests that you give us for written and programming, they do not affect like our final grade and stuff. Exactly. Yeah. So what you were asking is uh, about any uh, practice test. So any practice test, either written or uh, programming, written and programming. Yeah, I just again, I want to repeat just for everybody. So they are completely optional, meaning that for those of you who just want to see, uh, have some uh, extra practice, if you just want to get yourself familiar with the formats, that's uh, it's up to you to complete it. In case you only completed partially or you didn't even try, that's okay. It's not going to affect your marks in any way. No. Uh, I thank you. I appreciate okay, the, no problem. Yeah, I think that's an important question. I think one of your fellow students asked uh, me about the same question yesterday, not impacting your grade at all. All right, good. And MD, go ahead. Yeah, got some question about lab three. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so um, it, it's more of a general question. Sure, um, go ahead. So um, 
in one of the uh, methods in lab three, we were supposed to be converting feet into meters and vice versa. Sure. Uh, I believe with the toggle uh, measurement toggle measurements, uh, yes. method, right? Um, so I, I did kind of I did see your solution of it, um, mm -hmm. but I, I was uh, just focusing on the way that I was kind of doing it, mm -hmm. um, and I got a bit stuck on it. So. Uh, my method was that just like your way, I had a flag variable which would mm -hmm. say whether it's meters or um, is, is it, uh, is it a boolean condition. flag or just a string? Uh, no, just a boolean flag. So just a boolean. Like, okay, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and I was just wondering for um, converting. So, so my idea was that since meters would be a double, and yeah. feet would be an int. Yeah. Um, so other than um creating a new variable and type casting the int into double or double into int mm -hmm. into that new variable is there a way i could uh change an int to a double or a double to an int while just using the same variable um, so i noticed that in like print f statements or like system sure. out print line sure. okay you're able to do that but yeah. yes so, uh, Mandy, let me, uh, the, the, uh, let me confirm with you. So, when you said only use one variable, you mean only use maybe one variable for storing the number, right? Just one rather than two. Right. Okay. Yeah. I see what you mean. It's kind of a, what I did in the solution walkthrough, but let me just focus on that. Uh, we can talk about it. That's okay. I think okay. it's quite a nice uh, programming pattern for everybody to see as well. A small one. Uh, let me ignore the uh, modifier, like a public or private, just for simplicity. So, let's say Boolean, um, let's say is... Uh, let's say uh, kind of the mode. So either it's meter or not meter. Okay, it's meter. Okay, so let's say we got this uh, uh, attributes. So when we got our units constructor, right? Unit constructor over here, and by default we know that it's uh that its meter is going to be false for boolean. So by default we can simply explicitly assign its meter to be false. Its meter is actually false, let's say. And of course, we got more to actually fill in. Yeah, let me just do one by one. Okay, and for the units, actually we got function, we got width, we got length, right? So here, let's say, uh, so we have string, the function, and also int, the width, and also integer, the length. We got the three parameters. Assuming that you're gonna uh, initialize F and also W and also L, right? That's something we get to do. But let me say, we definitely have to store one version of the uh, units. Either we store uh, the value for the feet or we store the value for the uh, uh, the meters. Let's say we only store the value for the, the feet. So uh, let me just uh, put it here. So you can say integer, let's say uh, the width, and also integer, the length. Of course, in this case, it's not possible to store both values into a single variable. It's simply not possible. But I think that's a minimum uh, storage we are taking. We're only uh, storing width in the feet and also length in the feet. So that's what we're doing. And of course, you can assume that here dot 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 means we're going to initialize the width to be W over here, width to be W, and also the length to be L. Let's assume we'll do that. OK, let's talk about the toggle measurement over here. Talk of measurement in some way will be incredibly simple because all you want to do is to really change this particular value over here. So by default, its meter will just be false. So when you actually toggle measurement for the first time, you're going to change it from false to true. And the next time we from true to false and etc. Okay. So all you got to do is you're going to say here, uh, let's say void. Let's say, I'll just say toggle. And the toggle measurement is going to do uh, something like if uh, its meter currently is simply equal to true, right? I kind of mentioned in your solution walkthrough video. You can either just write its meter directly as a Boolean variable. So when it evaluates to true, you're going to execute if. When it evaluates to false, you're going to execute else. Rather than saying its meter equals equals true, it will be actually redundant if you think about it. Okay, anyway, so that's uh, some just trying to simplify your code as much as possible. If its meter currently is actually true, we're going to flip it to the false. So you would say its meter is actually false. Okay, otherwise, you're going to put it to false. I could put it to true. Its meter 
will be reassigned to true. Okay, so far we haven't touched anything about conversion just yet so far. Okay, and let's now go on to the two stream method. So over there, I will show to you, you don't really have to store any values about the meters. All you got to do is to store the width and the length. That's all you got to do. Okay, so you kind of a convert on demand. Whenever uh, there's a demand for you to uh, do the conversion, you will do it. Otherwise, you, you don't need to waste uh, the storage. So over here, what we can say, is, let's say we do the two screen method. Uh, let's see here. Of course, he's, he's going to return a string. Okay, string and then uh, two string. And here, there will be two cases for you to, uh, for you to return a string. Either the is meter is actually true, in which case you have to convert the width into meter and also length to the meter. Uh, to the meter, and in the in the second case where is meter is actually false, in that case you don't need to uh, do any conversion. You can simply re, uh, return the result for width and length, something like that. Okay, so what we can what we got to do is we're gonna say if is meter is actually true, in that case we're gonna do something over here, and I'll sketch what I gotta do. Okay. Otherwise, if its meter is actually false, that means we uh, we just need the uh, uh, the feeds. In that case, you got to do something else over here. Okay. So what you got to do here is uh, let's think about what you're gonna do. So here we got two attributes, width and length, right? So in the case of else, it is not meter. So all you got to do is you can say width, for example, width multiplied by length. You can use whatever that's actually stored in these two attributes without any conversion. And in this case over here, if it is meter, that means you're going to do some conversion. You got choices over here. Either you can have some local variables to say, for example, you can say local variable, uh, let's say with in meter. And then you can say it's going to be this dot with multiplied by whatever the conversion rate is. Of course, you can make it a constant, but I forgot exactly the number, maybe uh, something like that. Okay, let's say that's what you can do. You can just declare another local variable here. You, so the difference is we are we're only storing this value locally, meaning that whenever, as soon as the to string method terminates, these two variables will be reclaimed by the memory. So uh, they are not wasting any uh, resources beyond the methods, as opposed to if you actually declare them as attributes, you will, al you will always occupy some space uh, for the objects. So either you can try to do a local variable, or you can simply put the expression in line. So whenever, uh, let's say if you say string.formats, and then if you say percentage, let's say uh, dot 2f, right? That's actually for you, uh, for you to display the double number. In that case, you can simply just in line to say this dot with, and then multiply by 0 0.34. Right? So overall, the solution is good in the sense that we're only storing the values for the feeds in integer, and we don't store any double value uh, at, uh, at, the, uh, at the class level. So you can see that these are the only two attributes, uh, attributes we store. And in only one method do we have to actually uh, convert the feed into meters when, when necessary, if the mode is actually meter. So MD, does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, so uh, we're not actually converting, like we're not casting uh, width or length into a double, right? So it's just- No, we're not really casting. In some way, we are not. Okay. You can think about what's, uh, of course, over here, if you, uh, let's say, uh, for this local variable, you can simply declare that to be double. So whatever you calculate over here is gonna be stored into a double. And similarly, okay, so uh, when you calculate this, also be a double. Yeah, you don't do any casting. Yeah, that's not- uh, Okay. Not supposed to be done. Yeah. Um, so, so the width in M, that variable would be mm -hmm. a uh, cost double using the this dot width as the int. Uh -huh. right? So to be more precise okay. over here, uh, think about, okay, the way we declare this local variables to say is double. So we're okay. going to use the uh, attribute value, which is integer. And then uh, whenever you actually uh, multiply integer by some double, it's going to be so-called so coerced. Okay, coercion. Okay coerced. It's going to be coerced into double. So it's not really casting. So when you say casting, it's like when you got some integer, for example, let's say integer i, and then uh, it's equal to something. And then you're trying to cast uh, the i into some, um, sorry, let me just write it properly. Double and then i. 
if you write this expression over here, it will be considered as a cast. But that's not what we're doing over here, right? Here, we since, since you are trying to multiply an integer by a double, it will just be automatically converted into double. So there's no explicit cast that we're doing. Okay, I understand that. Thank you. Okay, good. Okay, good. Yeah, so guys, I think uh, nothing new over here. I think this uh, the sketch I just uh, presented over here is uh, consistent with what I put on the uh, solution video walkthrough for lab three. Okay, you can refer to it if you got doubts. John, go ahead. Right, I wanted to ask, when did when do you know to do a deep Oh, sorry, a deep copy or kind of like a, a superficial surface level copy. Do you mm -hmm. assume that if in the J unit test it doesn't explicitly ask for composition, mm -hmm. sure. that you can sure. do a child copy? I would say it's a good question. The question was when should you do shallow copy and when should you do a deep copy, right? Shallow copies versus uh, deep copies. In the, I can tell you that in the actual programming test, which you're going to take very soon, the instruction wouldn't really tell you whether you should do a deep copy or shallow copy because it's kind of up to your judgment, okay? And your judgment should be such that you will make the uh, JUnit test pass, okay? Let me just give you some example over here, okay? Let's say uh, we have some OBJ, okay? And then we say OBJ dot, for example, get, uh, just say get some objects, for example. Okay, let's say get object one. Okay, uh, let's say get objects. So version number one. Okay, and also we got another one. Let's say obj dot get objects. Let's say version number two. Right. Let's say uh, somehow the, the genome test cases are in hinting to you. You should really create two methods in the same class. Right. Of course, just by looking at maybe uh, just by looking at the comments or just by looking at the, uh, uh, you know, like a comments or problem description, it may not be so clear to you, like how they should be uh, implemented, either go for shallow or you go for deep, right? Either shallow or you go for deep. But I think they definitely, uh, you, they, you can definitely see the hit, uh, very explicit hints from the JUnit test. Let me give you one example. In the JUnit test, you might say assert, let's say same over here you might see over here let's uh let's uh let me do it again okay and then you might say obj dot get obj1 and then let's make the assumption that this is going to return an array okay that's typically the case let's say this one return an array Let's say, so here I might say a index zero for the return array. It is going to be the same reference as if I try to make the uh, the, the same call again, if they're separate independent calls. And then dot get object one, also version one, and then zero, right? All right, as soon as you see this one over here, what we, what we can see as you can see, uh, we're trying to call the same accessor method twice, but they're simply returning different objects, the return objects simply not the same. That's a very good hint about we are returning objects that cannot be shared, right? So I would say every time you can see the JUnit test assertion is telling you the return value uh, is actually some reference that should not be shared, like a copies. In that case, it, it's really good hints that you should really do deep copy. Right, right. So if it says, yeah. so yeah, if it hit, yeah. you, you mm -hmm. see a certain not same, Right away, like the L should be ringing your head, and you're like, okay, probably yeah, that should really give you a very good hint. So I would say, think about whenever we say composition, that really means. Uh, so whenever we say composition, that really means whatever you return should not be uh cannot be shared. On the other hand, if you're really talking about aggregation, so that means whatever you return can be shared. Positive. Okay, makes sense. Makes sense. And kind of similar. Uh, similar to the previous question when it comes to dealing with quotients instead of casting is it also okay if i just multiplied by like a double beforehand so like 
if I'm dividing like five divided by two, is it okay if I multiply by 1.0? Mm -hmm. Either way, I still get a double. I see what you mean. Okay, uh, that one, you know, let me uh, give you one example and then I can point to you some reference if you want to look at that. It's uh, something which I, I covered earlier. Uh, you know, of course, I cannot assume that on you, but something I covered uh, back in 1022. Anyway, let me show to you. Uh, if you got, for example, integer i, let's say it is 23. And also, if you got integer j, which is maybe uh, 4 over here, okay? If you simply do i divided by j, okay, the result is actually going to be actually just five. Okay, so the principle in Java is whenever you're trying to do division, if both operands are integers, so that means the return result is going to be the quotients only. It's not going to be like a, a precise result you would expect from mathematics. Okay, so it's basically a quotients. And of course, if you want to get a remainder, you would say i percentage sign j. So that's going to be uh, that's going to give you three, right? That's a remainder. Hey, it's actually very common because maybe whatever uh, operands you got are both integer, but somehow you really want to get the precise result, like how you would expect from mathematics. In that case, as you said, you have to somehow cast one of the operands into uh, a double, right? So there are different ways to do this, right? One way is to say, for example, I can say integer double. Oh, sorry, not the integer. I can say maybe double. Let me say, uh, let me give you a, a, at least two uh, possible uh, solutions. You can say double, let's say D is assigned to I. Okay, after you do this, you can say now the result, which should be a double, and it's actually simply uh, D divided by J. Right, so what's happening over here is, so when we do this, we know that i is actually 23. And when you try to save i as a double, it's going to do something called coercion. So d is actually going to store 23.0. It's going to add this uh, 0.0 uh, to, uh, to, uh, to it. And then when you, now, uh, when you now want to do the division over here, because this part, at least one side is actually a double, so 23.0. And divided by four is going to give you the precise result, which would be, uh, let me see. I believe that would be the result. So John, are you okay so far? Right, yes, makes sense. Okay, like, uh, I, I remember I heard you uh, said you can you simply multiply one of them by 1.0. I think that will work too. It's a similar idea. If you say I simply multiply maybe the i by 1.0, that, that will only uh, coerce uh, the i into some double value. That, that will also do it. But the more standard way of doing it, if you really want, is to do a cast, okay? What you can do is you can try to cast i into some double. You can say i over here, I'm going to cast that into double. And then I'm gonna make sure I do this first and then divide it by j. That one is also going to give you the precise result, uh, 5.75. And you can also choose to cast this variable as well if you wish, but you just need to cast, uh, just cast at least one of them. Make sense, John? Yes, makes a lot of sense. And okay, good. one final question is... Yeah, yeah John, just before part... your final question, just oh, before that, yeah, question. give me a moment. I'll just point out to whoever might be interested, if you want to review this part uh, from the first year, you can go to the lecture site and go to 1022. And then you will see under week number one. So there is one part called coercion and also casting. So that one will actually speak about exactly what I just said. Uh, you might just be able to find more examples and more possible solutions to the division problem. And you can also refer to the slides directly. I think that's about towards the end when you see casting and coercion. All right, for those of you who might want to look into that. All right, John, go ahead. Next question. Um, actually, no, it's okay. I'll save the question because I think it's better if we talk one on one for it. Uh, but thank you. I appreciate all the clarifications so far. No problem. No problem. All right. Another John, please. Sorry, I just had a question. Could you go back to the previous slide? Oh, I saw something on the chat. Maybe I did something. Okay. Yeah. Uh, what about it, please? Yeah, isn't that the same object, though? Because you said, is it supposed to be get object two at zero? Because those three are the same arrays, right? I mean, you mean this one here, right? Okay, John, so here's a trick, right? Look at this. 
it is true that we are calling the same method with the same context object, right? You can see we got obj.get obj1, and also we got obj.get obj1 over here. And we are also trying to get to the same index over here, right? However, you're wondering about why you will be a certain, not the same. That kind of tells you that when you return an array from the method call, you should always return a deep copy. Meaning that, meaning that, for example, let's say this is the first call, right? And let's say this is second call over here. And you can think about for the first one over there, it's actually going to actually just return a brand new array. You can say new array, right? Whatever size it is, is going to return like a new array over here. And every member in the array is guaranteed to be like a copy, right? It's a different objects like that. And then I'm just put two over here, okay? That's number one, okay? And number two over here, Skibana is really not the same. So you're still going to return just another new array, okay, over here, just brand new. And then every element there, rather than sharing the same object over here, that's not what we are aiming for. So that would have been uh, aggregation, but that's not what the assertion is telling you to do. What the assertion told you to do is, it tells you that you should really say, uh, here should be pointing to another object over here, and also another object over here. And they should, there will be some maybe a follow-up assertion to this. Let me, I can also mention that. So we can say assert, equals and then over here we can say obj dot get obj one at index zero and also obj dot get obj one zero so what we are trying to say is so you can see again the same method call oh let me just uh highlight the same the same uh the same method call over here and also the same method call over here. And also we are talking about the same index over here. Okay. So what we're saying, what we're saying is this. For this assertion here, we're saying that this blue object and this pink object, they are different objects. So that's why assert not the same. On the other hand, this blue object here and this pink object here will be equal by uh, in terms of their contents, depending on how you define the equality between the two objects. So that will be uh, the assert equals uh, is asking you to do. Does it make sense, John? So is there be like an overloaded method in equals x compared to specific things about? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So of course here I'm just being a little bit abstract. So the type of the object can be different. It could be maybe products, could be entry, or can be something. In that case, when I say assert every time when you see me using assert equals, that's almost especially for the upcoming programming test, that should be very good hints. Uh, that uh, you may just want to consider defining the equals method, overriding the equals method to be more precise. You want to override the uh, corresponding equals method in the relevant class. That's what you're going to do. So, so for our projects, is it like going to be a mix of composition and aggregation, or is it just aggregation? Like, for, uh, like I think uh, it will be more like a mix, but it will be mixed in a way that it will be very clear to you from the JUnit test. Maybe for this particular method, I want you you have to do a composition. And for another method that you want to do aggregation, you don't really mix the two inside the, the same method. Yeah, so in the same class, you can have specific things that you want, like here. Yeah, we, so we in the same class, it could be that maybe for get object number one method, you're supposed to work, uh, so supposed to make it work like a composition. Maybe you got another method in the same class called get object two. That one, that one should really work like an aggregation. So it's also possible. Okay, okay, I understand. I understand. Good. Awesome. I had a second question, too. Go ahead. Uh, it was like the difference between, um, like we, I think we talked about in yesterday's question and answer uh -huh. session, between cohesion and single choice principle. And if okay. we break one, we break the other. Oh, sorry. You said uh, uh, cohesion and single choice principle, and then? If we break one, do you break the other one automatically? or? No, 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 no. no. Okay. So the qu John's question was, if you broke, uh, if you broke one of the uh, principles of cohesion or single trace principle, do you break another one automatically? The answer is no. They are completely orthogonal. They are completely independent uh, design principles. Okay. Let me. Uh, this good question here. I think that these two principles are really important. Maybe you wouldn't hear about them until your third year course. Uh, maybe thirty three eleven. Uh, the software design course. But I think that it would be nice for you to actually be aware of such principles. Uh, starting uh, from this point. Okay. 
So we talk about single choice principle. And we talk about another one called cohesion. Let me start with the cohesion. For those of you, uh, which I didn't mention in the lecture, for those of you who might be taking or will be taking uh, EECS uh, 2031, I think that's the course about the C and the Unix uh, tools course, right? So there is a design, there's a very uh, single, uh, there's a very important design principle for the Unix uh, operating system. It's called a do one thing and do it well. And do it well. And what we're talking about is every command that you can actually run on the command line. For example, you, if you have used the uh, command line in the remote lab, like a ls or maybe cd or maybe rm for removing file, right? Every command over here is only supposed to do one single job. For example, you wouldn't say this command over here is going to list the directory contents and try to copy something at the same time. No. If you want to combine, if you want to do several things in your task, you have to combine several commands one after another, right? So that's kind of the principle that's very relevant to cohesion. Cohesion specifically for OOP, as I said in the lecture, is you want to make sure all the all the attributes and methods all the attributes and methods uh are related to uh, to the same thing to the same thing okay what does it really mean when you actually violate the single choice principle violating it means you simply got a very terrible mix of attributes and methods in your class. You can still make it work programmatically, but for large scale projects, you, your class somehow will actually tend to become so-called a Superman class, okay? Violating means uh, for large scale. For large scale projects or problem, your class will tend to be become so-called a Superman class. Okay, this is also a very special term, right, uh, uh, jargon. When you say a class is a Superman class, so that means your class is so big, and it, the class is trying to do so many things uh, in the same class, and that's not a good sign for software design. For the software design, you really want to make sure uh, your class is cohesive. Anything that's not really related to each other, they should not be put into the same class, right? So violating it simply means you got excessively big classes, but a cohesion, address nothing about duplicates okay nothing about duplicates on the other hand the single choice principle is really trying to address the issue about duplicates okay and for the and for single choice principle over here also it does not address about whether or not your uh, attributes and methods are related to each other right so that's why I said the two design principle are simply orthogonal. They are independence. It's not about uh, related uh, attributes and also methods, right? And for the single choice principle, uh, let me recap very quickly. Single choice principle simply means uh, a change should be made in a single or in some rare cases maybe in a number of places but the number should be a minimized a number in a single or minimum number of places and whenever you want to mix for example if you change the policy for uh, the get tuition, for example, you want to introduce uh, text, or maybe you want to introduce uh, inflation rates, or if you want to want to modify the registration policy, there should be only a single method you should uh, you need to modify. If you need to modify multiple methods, that would be a good hint that you're actually violating the single choice principle. Okay, so John, makes sense to you? So just like as an example, so let's say in the class we're discussing for the lab three, mm -hmm. or let's say we're doing the feet and meters. 
Okay. But then having like like the um. Yeah. What about yeah. it? Uh, so yeah. if, if we have specific if we have specific attributes for feet and specific attributes for just for meters, is that then uh, like breaking well, cohesion? Mm, I would say that's okay. Remember, or think about what what. <laughs> and you know, John, to be honest with you, um, the cohesion really says uh, everything should be related to a common thing. And it's uh, in some way, the definition is also vague. What do you really mean by common thing? It's really up to the definition of the implementer or the designer, right? So here, from my judgment, I would, I would tend to think the unit class over here is really about, you know, like a single units in the floor. And in, in that case, uh, I would consider uh, both the meter and the, the and the feet to be relevant to the to the idea about units. So that's why you wouldn't uh, violate cohesion. I would say there are certain there's certain gray area where you can argue either way. Okay. But in this case, I, to me, I think it's quite clear because uh, since we talk about units and the unit can be is uh, should be able to be easily changed from uh, uh, feet into meters and vice versa. So that's why those units must exist in the same class. If you don't like it, you can think about maybe the meter and uh maybe the meter and also the uh, the feet. You can think about they're more like a distinction between resident students and non-resident students. In that case, you can still try to create some inheritance for the two classes. Maybe one called feet units, the other one called uh, meter units, and then you can create some inheritance. But whether or not it's really worth it, uh, it's kind of up to you. Yeah, I was making the same connection between resident and non-resident students. Yeah, absolutely. That, that's actually that's what I thought you you would you would think that way. I think it's uh, absolutely valid. Um, whether or not you really want to break uh the unit class into three classes, maybe you got us uh, for example, uh, you can try you know just for your own practice. You may just have the unit class at the top, and then under which you actually got maybe the uh the uh units. Maybe call it units and feet. And also, you got the units in meters. Now, whether or not you really want to get to uh, these, it's kind of up to you. You can think uh, what one possible way for you to judge whether it will be worth it is about how many common attributes and methods you want to put in the unit class so that it will be shared among the unit in feet and unit in uh, meter. That's something that's up to your judgment, right? You can try, and then we can maybe carry uh, on that discussion maybe in my office hour if you want to. Okay, okay, perfect. perfect. All right, good. Conference. All right. Okay. Thank you. Well, John, any more questions for you? No, I don't have any more. Okay, okay, no, no worries. All right, let's say Daniel, go ahead. Hi. Uh, Hi. I have a question about the previous slide. The Sorry, the practice test? No, the previous slide. Uh, yeah, the, the previous, previous, uh, previous lab. Which lab? No, uh, this slide, I mean, this one. Oh, sorry, Daniel. So you're saying uh, about lab number three, or no, no, I meant slide, not lab. Oh, the, the previous slide. Okay, which which slide? Yeah, this yeah. one? No, we were just on it. The this one. Uh, two more to the right. The, uh, yeah. this one. Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. Yes. What about? Oh, no, no, no. So sorry, the one to the left. The one to the left. Okay, there we go. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Okay, what about? So. Yeah. So when we're asserting not same and equals. Mm -hmm. So, so we're, we're doing get object one for both. Get object one for both. Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. So I'm just wondering, like, why do we have to return a deep copy? Why can't we just return the reference? Uh, you're quite right. You know, I, uh, you know, in some way, think about the, the workflow of your test or for your lab. So whether or not uh, a method, uh, think about this method here, whether or not it should really return a shallow copy or deep copy. That one is more at the at the level of the design, uh, just about what what should be the intended function for this particular method. But for your lab and for your uh, programming task, usually the design decision has been made for you. So here I'm just saying that it has been uh, already made as a decision that get object one for whatever reason it is, it should always return a deep copy rather than uh, like a share link. On the other hand, we may have another version of the method that will be get object two. In that case, that should return an aggregation. So you don't really have to worry about whether or uh, why uh, this method should really return a composition, uh, should be implemented using composition, but the other one should be using uh, aggregation. 
that's kind of the uh, decision that will have been made already. And they, they're just re being reflected on the assertions over here. Right. So when so when we use composition, it's not necessary that we're going to be returning a deep copy. Uh, you know what? I, whether or not you should really return a true uh, deep copy. Again, it depends on how the assertion, how far the assertion will go. If the assertion only say this element here and this element here should be uh, different objects, and nothing, uh, and it didn't go any further. For example, it could be that maybe this object here also got some array over here. And this object also got another array over here. But let's say if the assertion did not elaborate any further about if a new array should be re, uh, returned for each one of them, in that case, it will be up to you. Either you can let them uh, return maybe separate arrays and also separate objects, or you can le simply let them share maybe the same array. That's also fine. So it's really up to how the JUnit test is guiding you. All right, I see. Mm -hmm. Cousin yeah. Lab. In lab three, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't like. I didn't notice anything that, like, for for like returning the floors, I didn't notice anything where we would return the deep copy. Yes, that in in some way that's true. How about this? I think for lab number three, a implementation uh implementation of a true composition will definitely make it work. On the other hand, if you kind of compromise a little bit, let's say you only implement deep copy only at the floor level. But when you get down to the unit level, you simply allow sharing. That's also fine for lab number three because the assertion didn't go that far. So that's why I said whenever you want to decide, uh, let's say uh, as far as the lab is also programming test a concern, you don't really have to worry about whether that uh, should be a true composition or not true composition. You, have, you want to see what the tests are actually asking you to do. Okay. And beyond this course, of course, if you do your own projects, uh, in another course, when we in your internship or co-op, of course, you have to make some design decision whether or not the method you're talking about should really be a true composition or only to some extent for composition. Okay. Okay. So, so a true composition means that even when we use the accessor methods, we're still returning like another deep copy. Exactly. Yeah. So a true composition could be that when you actually implement a copy constructor. You already try to make a deep copy of the uh, of the parameter objects. In that case, any uh, subsequent accessor will guarantee to actually return a deep copy because you already created a deep copy in the first place. So that'd be uh, pretty much like what we did, you know, in the directory example in the lecture. So in so in the accessor, if you already make the deep copy in the constructor, then like why do you make another one in the accessor then? Yeah, so if you, well, again, it depends on how you actually approach it. If your constructor already got a deep copy, in that case, it, it will not be necessary for your accessor to really uh, also return a, a deep copy, right? On the other hand, if uh, it might be that uh, there might be several methods in the same class, right? Maybe some methods actually want a, a, like a shallow copy and some methods actually request maybe deep copy. In that case, you wouldn't really want to implement the constructor as the deep copy in the first place. Because once you implement your constructor as a deep copy, you have no chance to really share the references anymore. Right? So I think it's really like a balance you have to uh, strike. All right. I think I get it. It's yeah. Like but you know, I think uh, I can, it's a very good question here. But I think uh, 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 the bottom line. Um, I would say every time you really make a commitment to whether deep copy or shallow copy for your methods or constructor, always follow how the, uh, how the test actually specify what you have to do. All right. All right. Yeah. Good. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Okay. So, okay. So we have uh, Gray Luff. Go ahead. Yep. Yeah. Hi. Hi, Professor. Hi. So I have a question related to the practice test i was wondering in a mm -hmm. case like that where there are two different packages there's the aggregation package and yep. there's the composition package yep. Yep. but they both have very similar classes between mm -hmm. them like all of them are point line line collector and all of that mm -hmm. i was trying to implement an inheritance structure like to make just one point base class and then copy the points from mm -hmm. and then make subclasses for each of the packages. Mm -hmm. But as I was trying to do that, I kept on coming across instances where I'm trying to implement 
I'm trying to create a constructor for the line. And mm-hmm. then in the line, I'm trying to say, okay, let the starting point be a new point object or a yeah. new point instance. And then instead of pointing to the composition point, it points to the aggregation point class. <laughs> so I was wondering if you know any workarounds for this or yeah. if it's yeah, I see what you to mean. just leave them separate. Yeah, I, I got your point. Uh, very good thoughts, actually. So um, Gray Love's question was, in your practice number, uh, practice test number two, in aggregation and also in composition, for example, one of the classes is called line. You got line.java and also line.java over here, right? I think the very reason that I want to split uh, these two classes into different packages is actually because you're right. These two classes look very similar. One is mainly to implement methods that will allow sharing. And the other one is going to implement method that will uh, actually uh, not allow sharing, but to support uh, like a true composition, you know, or as true as possible. So what you're saying is, since you see so many duplicates between the code, in some way, yes. So you want to see if this is possible, maybe to have a maybe have a common uh, parent class, maybe call it line, and then mm-hmm. and then maybe under which you want to have maybe. Uh, uh, let's say aggregation line versus over here, maybe um, composition line. Okay, it is possible to do it. Uh, I haven't really tried it myself, but let me give you some idea. For example, let's say here you got a line over here. This would be some constructor. For example, this would be some copy constructor line L. Okay, and also maybe you got another one. Let's say uh, let's say get start. Right, it's you're gonna return the points, the point, and then get start. And let me let me uh, also give you some uh, look ahead. Okay, using inheritance is definitely one possible way to go. However, if you try to put line as a parent class, you also need to supply some code into, for example, this uh, accessor method over here. And also some code into this accessor method here. And what the the best you can do later is to say now I want to overwrite. I I want to overwrite in both aggregation line and also composition line. Over here I can overwrite and overwrite. So here I can give a version of the copy constructor over here. Uh, oh, first this is not called line. This one is going to call aggregation line. And this one here is going to. Okay, and we got another one composition line. And in this case, of course, you can uh, put some common code into the parent class, which will be inherited to here and also here. So that's good. And you can just put any additional uh, lines of code, which is going to implement either aggregation or composition. So that's that's fine for the constructor. And now for actually for the uh, Get star, for example, for the uh, accessor method. Again, since the uh, we basically got the same uh, method name and also the same return type, but they sh- it should be implemented in a very different way. Either you can say here, you gotta redeclare that in either case uh, to overwrite. So you're gonna say point over here and then get start. And also point over here and also to say get start. So, so the static uh, the static type over here line is gonna uh, one of the uh, one of its expectation is to get a start, and now this expectation is also available to both the aggregation line and also composition line. So in the at the runtime, uh, for example, let's say if I got if I got line L is let's say new aggregation line over here. So what we see is uh, the that uh, this is a static type. And this part here is the dynamic type. Okay, if I try now to say L dot get start. So now because of dynamic binding, which we uh, cover in week number seven, because the dynamic type for L is actually currently aggregation line. So dynamic binding is going to make sure it's going to call the version of get start from the dynamic type, which is aggregation line. So that one will actually do the aggregation. On the other hand, if you change the uh, dynamic type from aggregation line into composition line, calling this is going to make sure it called this version. Oh, sorry, this version instead. The get start. So I think uh, uh, 
the uh, inheritance solution is actually going to work. But for your particular uh, uh, try, I would say maybe show it, uh, if you want, show me the code that you have got maybe during the office hour. So I can maybe point to you like uh, which error you might have got. Okay, then I'll see you at office hours. Yeah, but yeah. I think this yeah, you can, you can, uh, so this one may not be uh, so urgent, you know, for, uh, for th uh, this programming test. You can show it to me today or maybe next week. Either way, it's up to you. Okay, I don't have it right now because I just created different classes. So I'll okay. get that. So, yeah, so why don't you try to maybe go with what I'm hinting over here? I think that if I were to do it, this is how I would do it. Why don't you give it a try and then to see if you guys uh, get stuck at a certain point. <clears throat> Excuse me. And you can come to me maybe uh, next week and we can take a look. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. And one more thing for everybody. So here, about this particular method over here. If you think about the design, okay, I want, I'm just looking uh, looking ahead, uh, what we're going to cover uh, in week number nine, okay? If you look at this method here, at this level over here for line, I don't really know whether this part over here should be aggregation or composition, because that decision is not going to be uh, going to be clear until either I get to the aggregation line, in which case, get star should really be implemented the aggregation way, or until over here in the composition line class where I know that the get star should be implemented the composition way. So at this point here, it's better that I don't put any implementation, but only putting that as empty is not a very good uh, practice. So that's why, so there's something called abstract method or abstract classes, right? So uh, the most ideal solution eventually uh, that we're gonna cover will be so something called abstract method. Abstract method simply means at this point, I simply don't know how the method should be implemented. So I'm just going to make the method abstract, meaning that I'm only going to give you the header of the method without supplying the implementation. And my child classes or my descendant classes, aggregation line and composition line, they must implement this particular abstract method as inherited. So that's something we will cover in week number nine, where we speak about uh, abstract class versus interfaces. Right, that's uh, the next topic. I will give you look, some look ahead. Okay, John, you got more questions? I was just curious about something. Because, so because like for this example, mm -hmm. when, because the Java tests are given to us. So then when the objects get created, so let's say like our aggregation line, that was okay. like a aggregation line L equals new aggregation line. So we, we can assume that, right? Because assuming that we're, like it just deals with only that one, like. Part of it, correct? Instead of mm -hmm. line so, John, uh, can you say that again? I don't quite follow you. So, when we create, because the Java tests are given to us, when they're the, like the, the assumption that's made there, like the new object that's going to be, be made, its static type is going to be aggregation, line, right? Mm -hmm. Not not line, correct? Uh, no, no, no. So, here, uh, aggregation line is a dynamic type over here. That one will determine the version of the get start method that will be called, right? It's static type over here, as according to what we learned in week number eight, right? Um, uh, okay, let me uh, let me uh, say a little bit more over here before I uh, okay. Let's say here. So what we are really talking about is like this. We want to say something over here, uh, static type. Let's say uh, L, some line, is new. Let's say aggregation line over here, and maybe something here. Okay. So this part over here is the dynamic type. And what can this be? Okay. According to what we learned from week number eight. Okay. So John, uh, you want to tell tell me or tell us if given that this is the aggregation line, what can this be? The static type will be valid according to the hierarchy over here. Aggregation line or line? Okay, let me just copy that diagram there so it'll be easier for us to make a reference to it. Can you say that again? Uh, definitely aggregation line. Anything else? Or, or line? A line, not composition line, right? Okay, so now why line? Because it's, a, it's its parent class. 
It's a parent class, yes, or more precisely, it's a ancestor class. And it, okay, now I'm not gonna uh, push you any further. So in case you were asked this question in the written test number three, or most likely the exam, okay? I might give, for example, let's say this is a question. Why can I put line over here as the static type, whereas the dynamic type is actually aggregation line? Why can I do that? It is actually because the aggregation line can fulfill the expectation on line, given that aggregation line is a descending class of line. So these are the two things I expect you to say in the answer. Okay, let me put it down here. So this will be valid, okay, especially this one here, if I put line here, because number one, the aggregation line is a descending class of line. And consequently, aggregation line can fulfill the expectations on line. All right, so that's uh, kind of the explanation you want, uh, maybe you meant to say, but just make sure you say them uh, when you ask this question here. Uh, John, it's uh, can I answer your question or you got something else? It does, but it's kind of out of this topic because I was going to ask something about abstract classes and like implementation versus this, because then you, the, the rule of having to override all the methods versus not overriding all the methods for the abstract classes. No, nope. uh, yeah, so let us not worry about the abstract class just yet. I just okay. mentioned that, yeah, so okay. you, you have an idea. We're going to cover that at some points. But you're right. Uh, it, uh, whenever you actually inherit from the class, all the abstract methods must be implemented in the current class. Otherwise, the current class will also become abstract. That's something we'll talk about. But let's say for now, let's say this is still in, uh, declared as non-abstract. So that means you got some code over here. It's up to the, in the individual subclasses whether or not they want to override it. It's not mandatory. I understand, sir. I also had a, se uh, um, like a second question, not related to this. It was mm -hmm. related to the example of the, the two arrays. And the two arrays? Well, which one? You mean a, is that a new uh, question? Or? No, it was, we, we talked about it before. Here? Yep, yep, there. OK. Yeah. So um, like, if we go like, uh, but like in the next level below this, let's say we have like a we assigned object dot object dot that get object one the index zero uh, to a to a new object itself, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And we're comparing specific things about let's say name, which name would be like string. Mm -hmm. and then the only what we would be comparing there, and let's say we assert let's say assert not same, we would be comparing the, the specific strings of each. But if we did assign new string when we're creating. Uh, Object that get object one that would still relief uh, from like that's still um, test. Right? Okay, so if you try to reassign, okay, let me try to uh, try to guess what you really meant over here. Let's say this. So what we can do is we can try to have some array. Let's say array of certain type. Let's say a. Okay, just type a, and then we'll say this is some array is uh, this particular method call. Right. Let's say obj dot get object one okay let's say that's the array you were saying something about to reassign maybe the first index i can say a zero is actually reassigned to some other objects for example maybe uh some uh object uh some uh some object two for example it's just even an attribute of it not even the object itself just an attribute of it uh mm -hmm. Okay, so maybe uh, you cannot really assign uh, the uh, member over here directly to some attribute value. You cannot. Uh, okay, either you can reassign the object to something else, or you have to call some mutated method. Maybe you meant to call mutated method, right? Yeah, exactly. So on the okay. object, call mutated Okay, method. let's say this. Let's say we do that. Okay, if you say set uh, x, for example, or set whatever to be some value over here. Okay, so what that's going to do is it's actually going to only modify uh, this particular one. Right, so let's say this is actually being returned into A. So A is actually pointing to this particular array. And then you're saying that you want to go to index zero over here and then modify somewhere over here, for example. And later on, if you try to make another call, object that gave object one, that's going to return to you another array with a deep copy. In that case, of course, if you compare these two, uh, they are different. 
because whatever you change over here on the one deep copy is not going to impact another deep copy. Yeah, but, but if we weren't given this assert not same and we're given only this, this assert not same, you know what I mean? Like the attribute of the, this specific object. Yeah, of course, you know, if, if you're yeah. only given this assertion over here, that one only tells you that these two objects must be different. It doesn't tell you anything further about whether maybe there's another object link from over here. Should they be the same or not the same? If the test didn't really say. So that means either one, either implementation is acceptable. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But if we're, but if we're, let's say, a certain not same, uh, a, a at zero dot get, let's say, get x versus obj dot get object one at zero dot get x. And those two are supposed to be a certain not same. We then, like, don't know if we're supposed to do it, like, at this level or just at the string level. So, for example, let's say, let's say after this particular method call, let's say after this, let's say after I try to change something over here. And then uh, maybe I can also assert, uh, I can assert again to see whether these two objects should be the same, right? If they are not the same, of course they are separate copies. I can also try to assert equals to see if the if the contents are equal. So I think it's really up to the uh, the the, uh, the the test that's given to you. I can understand. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that we should really worry too much about this particular example here. This one is a little bit abstract. I mainly just want to uh, 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 illustrate to you the point that if you got not the same, it only suggests these two objects must not be the same, uh, must be different objects. That's all it says. So that's why when you return the array, you want to make sure you make a copy of separate copies each time for the uh, array members. That's all you got to do, got to, got to know. There might be some uh, additional assertion that follow later that will actually tell you what happened to maybe the next level of the object. What should what should what should happen? So you just follow through the uh, what's really being suggested to you by the tests. Okay. All right, guys. Any more questions? Anyone? Okay. So. I'll pause for one more moment, but at the same time, I just want to go back to what I, what I said in the very beginning. Definitely, your programming test, too, uh, is very important. Definitely want to do it well. But I think for your final exam, which is also very important for this course, the inherited lecture that we actually spend quite a bit of time on, we'll, we'll actually end up spending at least uh, three weeks on the inheritance topic. So we're already on the middle of that, uh, week number eight. So I'm going to release the week number nine lecture next Monday. So you want to make sure you actually study them properly, right? So it's a very, uh, well, for those of you who haven't got ex exposed to inheritance uh, contents, it might appear very tricky. So that's why it does take time for you to uh, think about what you, uh, what you don't understand. So you can ask me, right? So you want to really finish that in time. Okay, I cannot emphasize that any uh, more. All right, uh, let, let me ask one more time. Do you guys have any more questions about the materials? I still have my office hour today at 3 p.m. for one hour. You can, you're, feel, uh, you're free to, uh, you're welcome to drop by if you want to. All right, here we none, guys. Thank you so much for coming. I will end the meeting now and then good luck to your programming test. I'll see you later. Take care.